All right, we are recording. Okay, welcome to the uh, Finance Committee and special meeting of the Town Council. It's uh, October 18, 2022, and it's uh, 3 p.m. So I'm calling the meeting of the Finance Committee to order. I'm going to um, then go through the usual steps to begin the meeting, and then I'm going to turn it over briefly to Lynn, who's going to call the council meeting to order, after which I will explain um, what how these two meetings are going to be handled today, because it's a little different from how we've done uh, combined meetings before. But let me start by saying that pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, which has been extended by subsequent legislation, this meeting will be conducted by a remote by a remote means. Members of the public who wish to attend the meeting may do so by Zoom or telephone. There is no in-person attendance of members of the public, but every effort is being made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Uh, I also want to remind everyone that this meeting is being recorded um, and uh, so that uh, it, it, it's uh, there's public notice of the fact that it is being recorded uh, visually in audio. Um, so with that being said, what I'm going to do is um, call on members of the Finance Committee to make sure that they can hear and be heard. And then I'm going to turn it over to Lynn, who's going to uh, take steps to convene the meeting of the Council. So um, I'll start with Lynn, and uh, just to confirm you can hear. Present. And Bob. Present. Uh, Present. Uh, Matt, Matt Holloway. Present. Uh, Bernie Kubiak. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Um, Kathy Shane. Here. And I'm present. And I think that Alicia will be um, joining later so that um, because uh, of her work schedule. Um, so uh, we need to keep an eye on the participant list on both sides to make sure that she gets into the meeting as quickly as possible if she doesn't, uh, if she signs on as an attendee. Lynn? I'm going to call the council meeting to order. Yes. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the town council meeting to order at 3.03. I'm going to check with those councilors that are not on the finance committee to make sure that they can hear us and we can hear them. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Uh, I'm here, but I'll have to leave early to go pick up my grandson. Thank you. Um, Pat no, Pat DeAngelis. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Shalini Balmilm. Yes. Present. I believe that's it. I'm here too, but you already heard me. Anna? Yep, still here. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so as I uh, said, usually when we do these joint meetings, the reason that they're posted as council meetings is because it's an issue that's being discussed by the Finance Committee that is of sufficient interest to the Council that uh, we uh, recognize that a quorum of the Council may wish to attend to participate in the discussion. And later in the meeting, um, Sean Mangana is going to um, make a presentation about alternative approaches that and the um, factors to consider for each one for the um, completion of the four major buildings and how they could be financed. And uh, he will explain it more when he gets there. But uh, we also last night um, postponed two motions at the council meeting to the next um, and by the rules of the uh, charter and the uh, rules of the council, they have to be considered at the next meeting of the council. So this is a council meeting for that purpose also. Um, and Lynn will explain what those two issues are, even though I think all counselors know, but um, 
the uh, resident members of the uh, finance committee may not know. Um, and uh, we're going to address those questions first and then come back and uh, we'll um, have Sean make his presentation. And then the last item for uh, consideration today is Sonia's with us is going to be the uh, fourth quarter and year end, which is a combined report of um, the budget for the year that ended um, on June 30. Lynn, I therefore uh, turn it over to you for the first section of the meeting. Thank you. Uh, there were two motions last night uh, were postponed via the provisions of Charter Section 2.10C. Under this section, a motion is postponed to the next meeting of the council, whether regular or special. Those two motions, therefore, have to be taken up today at this three o'clock meeting, which coincidentally had been already posted. Uh, however, uh, I'm going to deal with the first motion, and then I'm going to uh, come back to the second. But after I deal with the first motion, I'll be looking for a second. So I am going to move that to postpone the motion that is on the floor made by Michelle Miller and seconded by Alicia Walker to November 1st, 2022, 6.30 p.m. Is there a second? Second, Devlin Gothier. Thank you. Let me explain my motion. And then I'm going to call on Mandy Jo, um, who would also like to speak. Uh, the mo I, since last night, I have conducted a poll of both the council and the CSSJC. While I'm still waiting for a few final responses, um, I am uh, at the November 1st uh, date, which is a Tuesday uh, at 6.30, seems to be the date that we can get the most number of counselors and the most number most number of members of the CSSJC. I also do want to note that in the audience tonight uh, or today, excuse me, uh, Philip Avila is in the audience. He is a member of CSSJC, uh, but th this is not a meeting of the CSSJC. Uh, and so um, I also felt that it was important that this meeting be held as a joint meeting and that uh, that is one reason why I've pulled so both. So that's really all my explanation. Uh, the motion to uh, postpone means that we will not be discussing the motion um, and uh, we'll leave it at that. Mandy Jo. Thank you. To my colleagues on the council, last night I used my charter right to postpone for a motion that was made during the last minutes of a council quote time limited discussion a discussion which was noticed under discussion items not action items and for which counselors had no opportunity to prepare that a motion might be made no ability to read the motion and no ability to think in solitude either ahead of time or during the meeting about the reasons to support or oppose the motion through no fault of any counselor i was completely unprepared to discuss consider, or even contemplate the motion last night. I needed time, time that I did not have if the discussion and vote would have proceeded. So I invoked my right as a counselor under the town's charter to postpone the debate and vote to give me time. I knew there would be opposition and disappointment to using this right that all 13 of us have as counselors to ask for more time to do what we have been elected to do. It was not comfortable. It was not enjoyable. At the time, I knew I was not in a safe, tolerant, or compassionate space to use the charter right. But I did, because I needed the time. Time that over the past day has been condemned by not just those watching, but you, my colleagues. I ask that we, as a full council, and individually, reflect on the values we have adopted. Respect. We value a culture of kindness, compassion, and respect for different points of view, experience, and knowledge. Grace. We value allowing people the space to be human, to make mistakes, and to learn and grow from those mistakes, 
to experience adverse situations without thinking of themselves or others as lesser than and to be their authentic selves. Teamwork, we value our colleagues working in collaboration and taking pride in our collective work. Diversity, inclusion, and equity. We value the diversity of our residents, the inclusion of voices, ideas, and cultures that reflect Amherst's rich personality, and the creation of safe spaces and equal opportunities for participation. Tolerance. We value the expression of diverse perspectives, even when we don't agree with them and we don't put our own perspectives above others. I ask us as a council to think about what happened last night, not just after I postponed the discussion until today, but before that too, and in other meetings since we took office 10 months ago. In the past 10 months, have we been valuing a culture of kindness, compassion, and respect during our meetings? Have we been allowing people the space to be human during our meetings? Have we been allowing counselors, staff, and the public to make mistakes and to learn and grow from those mistakes? Have we been creating safe spaces for counselors to participate in our meetings, to make statements that might challenge the prevailing wind? Have we valued the expression of diverse perspectives even when we don't agree with them? I know I can't say we have to all of these questions. Let's collectively figure out a way to forward that uplifts our values and calls colleagues, staff, and residents into discussions. Instead of pushing each other away from tough discussions and intimidating each other into staying silent because of fear of the re repercussions of expressing diverse perspectives or admitting we need time to just think. I thank the counselors who have reached out to me to ask why I used my right to postpone, whether they agreed with me and my use or not. I thank the counselors who've reached out to see if I'm okay. I also respect the position of the counselor who last night withdrew from partnering on an upcoming measure that is intended to address racial inequities in our zoning laws, although I'm saddened. If that counselor changes their mind, I will gladly welcome the collaboration again on this matter or others where we can find common ground. Thank you for allowing me the time to speak. Mandy Jo, thank you very much. Um, I'm going, I would like to have us move on to the vote because we do have the finance committee meeting and we have a full agenda for that. Uh, Lynn, the reason I had my hand up is so uh, one of us needs to make sure that Alicia can hear and be heard. She's joined the meeting and the minutes need to reflect that. Thank you. Alicia, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Lynn. And Alicia, thanks for getting here as fast as you could. There, Alicia, there is a motion on the floor to postpone uh, the discussion of uh, the motion and discussion made by Michelle Miller and seconded by you to November 1st at 630. And that is based on a poll that I've conducted today of both the council and the CSSJC since it would be a joint meeting. Um, Michelle, I, I'm really hesitant to get into a conversation at this point, but I am going to respect the fact that you might want to speak to the motion, which is on the floor. I, I don't want to speak to the motion that's on the floor. I want to speak to what just happened. Um, while I really appreciate that Mandy came forward with this statement, there were people last night who needed to be heard and they were silenced. And the idea that I, I again, I, I understand this is frustrating, but I feel like we have to have some consistency in the way that we're managing people's voices because um, there were people that needed to be heard last night and they weren't able to be heard. I am very, very sure, sure that each of us has various things we would like to say, but there is a motion on the table and I think that motion on the table should is what we should address at this point. Dorothy, you have your hand up. I want to paraphrase a story from Martin Luther King about the man who pushed another man into a hole and then felt victimized because he hurt his arm when he did it. 
Thank you. I'd like to move on to the vote. The vote is to um, meet again on November 1st when we will pick up and take the motion that is on the floor. Um, let me start. I don't have my normal list in front of me. Let me start with Shalini Balmain. Yes. Um, Anna Devlin Gothier. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Um, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Michelle Miller. Aye. Mandy Jo Haneke. Aye. It's unanimous. We're going to move on. I'm sorry, Lynn, you haven't voted. I'm sorry. And, and you and you Alicia also didn't voted. call on me. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Alicia. Yes. Oh, and I didn't vote. I. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is unanimous. Uh, we also are going to go on to the next item, uh, and that is the other item that was uh, put placed on the kept on the floor. I just want to find it. Okay, and that is to adopt appropriation transfer order FY twenty three. Um, dash O5C and order appropriating funds for a proportion of the town of Amherst capital program school track and field rehabilitation recommended by finance committee on October 17th, 2022 and shown on page nine of the draft motion sheet. The motion was made by myself, Lynn Griesmer and seconded by Anna Devlin Gothier. It is now back on the floor. Is there any discussion on the motion? Dorothy, you have your hand up. Okay, Jennifer. Um, yes, I just had a question. Would now be the time to? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I was where it's. I was had a question about the fundraising that's happened on the part of the other towns. I was just if I could have a little more information on that. Uh, Sean, I think you're the best person to answer that at this point. Yeah, so um, so my understanding is that the uh, regional school district business manager, Doug Slaughter, um, ha has either submitted or is going to submit based on their upcoming timeline CPA requests to each of those communities. Um, I don't know for how much or what portion, but he is, Doug Slaughter is working with the other communities to come up with what they've identified as their shares of the project. Um, the request in front of you today is the final piece of the town of Amherst share as outlined in the plan that the, the regional school district put together. And I, I want to note that we did have a counselor who asked that specific question. Uh, they are not able to be here at this meeting, but it is the final payment for our share. It is not an additional payment. Okay. Um, Shalini. Yeah, I could we just clarify for the public when the public comment will be? Because there are two hands in the public. Uh, Andy, do you want to have public comment right after we're finished with this before we go on? Actually, I'm glad that uh, the question has been raised. I was wondering if we should have separate public comment for the uh, council meeting. Mm -hmm. Um, because of the two issues that are on the council agenda, one which we've discussed and uh, the one that's on the table, and uh, then have separate comment on financial issues, including the capital projects, which will be uh, discussed later. Okay, that's fine and with me. So, Shalini, we'll have public comment as soon as we conclude this discussion and vote. Thank and you. I, and I had a question too about this. Um, I believe that there was going to be fundraising from the players and the parents. And if we raise the funds, then we were going to go one way. And then if we didn't have the funds, we're going to go. Do we know anything about that? Like which way it's going to go? And also the question that was raised yesterday about the material being used, are we did we decide that the health board is going to look at that and make a decision on that? So those are the two questions. Okay. Paul or Sean? I can answer the 
first one and um, maybe Paul, you can help with the second one. But um, so there, my understanding is there is a group um, that's starting to look into the fundraising. I don't believe any funds have been raised yet. Um, so, but if we, if the town of Amherst approves the allocation today, there is still more work that needs to be done to get to the, um, the benchmark that the regional school committee has set. Um, and again, that will be up to the regional school district to either, you know, uh, to solicit the, to get the funds from the other towns, um, or for the fundraisers to generate those funds, um, or for the regional school committee to, you know, reconsider their vote because they set the they set the date and the the threshold that they have to meet. And then the second question about the uh, materials. So, um, so I think it's a good question. It's certainly in the news a lot today. Um, you know, I was looking into a little bit. There's there's certainly information going both ways. It's hard to kind of get definitive information on it. Um, the only thing I'll say is that it, it's it's on regional school district property and it's the regional school district has voted specifically for the synthetic turf. So I think any discussion or, or um, you know, questions about the impacts of synthetic turf, um, we should think about posing those to the regional school committee um, as they move forward. Thank you. Uh, Dorothy? Yeah. Uh, I was asked by Pam Rooney just to pass on the words that she supported the 900,000 last year, but has seen no signs of fundraising. And she supported repairs, not the full-blown makeover. And she would like to see the 900,000 put into the capital stabilization fund. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, she, uh, Councilor Rooney was also the one who asked whether this was part of our commitment and the answer to that question is yes, it is part of what we voted earlier. Kathy. Um, I, I, I want to make a comment that I think is accurate, but I want to have it confirmed by Sean when we talked about this earlier at finance, that if the other towns fail to raise the amount of money or the fundraising doesn't, this is contingent money, our 900,000 on it happening, and then it reverts back. And I think we did discuss it would go into a stabilization fund. So I just wanna make sure, confirm that, that because we set a deadline of January, um, which is we're now almost November. So if we don't have evidence, this, the question goes away, we, the 900,000 aren't spent. Will we be writing this in a way that makes it contingent? That's my, I know the CPA money uh, excluded the synthetic material. It can't, it can't be spent on it. So, um, so I'm just trying to get a sense. So CPA goes away, 900,000 goes away and just the amount we originally voted in our capital share stays. Is that correct? And then I have one other question. So Sean, is that correct? Yeah. So if this amount is approved today, if the if the larger project does not move forward, um, think of this as like a capital project um, that gets approved by the council, you know, for a truck or something. We we create an account, we put the money into it. Um, if that project is not pursued, that project would get closed out and be available for appropriation, and it could be appropriated into the the capital stabilization fund or some other reserve fund from there. Um, but it can only be used on the purpose that we specified. Um, and I believe we amended the motion to make it very clear that the project that we're considering today is option three, um, which is what the regional school committee um, wrote into their debt authorization, which is the turning the, the track and having a synthetic surface in the middle. Um, so if there's any other project besides that one, it would have to be sort of reconsidered um, to see if it's still consistent with the purpose. Um, so that's the 900,000 being requested today. The CPA, as you, as you noted, that was previously approved, that's a debt authorization. So if that, um, if this project doesn't move forward, that debt authoriz authorization would be rescinded and that would also go away. And, and then, I know they and we'd be left the, over with the original one point five million. And they put contingency too. It was contingent on the larger project, not. Yeah, the yeah. CPA one. The reason why it says can't be used for synthetic turf is because synthetic turf is not yeah. eligible for CPA funds, but it, it's for that project, the option three. So my second question is: um, I've been overseas, but watching the issue of the health effects of synthetic turf, we had a quick discussion on. ACL turfs, uh, tears earlier on. on. So it, it, even if the region has said they want to go this route, 
could Amherst's award be contingent on a finding of the health department that there was not a likely a negative health? Could we make it contingent, Sean? And so raise this issue at the regional school level with that wording. Um, I'll look to Sonia to see if that's ever been done before, but I would say no. I think it would be tough to have a contingent order um, to, to approve something based on that now. I, I think if that's the if that's the will, I would say hold on the vote um, until you get, get that and then vote based on that. Um, but we can look into it. I just don't know if we've done contingent orders like that before. But because we probably haven't had, to my not, certainly in my time, the four years, we haven't had anything with this kind of issue in right. it. That in concept, we want to fix the track, but an issue has come up about the materials. So, so I just would like clarification on that because it's actually the first time I'm reading some of this material. Thank you. Michelle. Yeah, I'm sort of lost in all this in the sense that this came back here because of the postponement issue, but the finance committee, we had already made a recommendation, right? Okay, so, and then I read Tony's email, Tony Cunningham's email, which added a lot of information for me that brought, you know, questions and concerns. So, Kath, I'm just wondering, did you have a chance to read that email? And is that what you were just addressing yeah, um, exactly. It okay. that was that was literally the first time I've heard some of those issues. The main issues I'd heard before, up until now, had been, um, and those ha have been improved. Is that there were more ACL tears because of the the what the turf did. But apparently, according to my husband, who follows artificial turf, even that issue is less than it used to be. And when we talked about artificial turf, the argument for it was it allows for more seasonal use that it's it's less less often out of commission than is grass um but i don't think we ever talked about to what extent we could in our partnership agreements with umass and amherst which we don't now have on uh, could we ever use their their fields um do we have to build our own with artificial turf but Michelle, yes, that was new information to me that I hadn't had before. I, I want to make sure we remember that it is not our decision on the artificial turf. It is the school district's decision. And if we want to take this up or if individuals want to take it up with the regional school district, they should do so. Okay. But but just sorry to follow up, Lynn, just to make sure I understand. So our vote on this is it's it's not conditioned, like it's basically unconditional. So we're saying nine hundred thousand dollars, whatever you all decide to do with it, we're approving that amount. And there's really not much else that we have the power to do other than to try to advocate for something that's not synthetic. Is that the only condition on this vote is that if the rest of the money is not raised, then this money will not be spent for that, and it will revert to the town coffers. That's the only condition on this. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Are there any more questions about this vote? Uh, we clarified earlier that this one only requires a majority, which in this case, I want to clarify with the town clerk. Is that a majority of those present or is it a majority of the council? I'm sorry, majority of those present. Thank you. And all right, Kathy. Okay, you you've told me we can't make it contingent. Sean said- No, I, it would, I uh, said it, so only I, contingency at this time is on the issue that if the rest of the money is right. raised- Right, but I'm talking on the health. So if we said we want to postpone this discussion till the regional committee has taken up the issue of health and had they even considered it when they went this route. So it's my, it's just, it's, I didn't have this information before. Um, if and, you want to make that motion, then I would suggest you make that motion. Okay. Okay. Jennifer? Um, I guess you know, just picking up on Kathy about motions. Um, could it also be a motion to postpone till we get a determination or recommendation from our board of health? It, you can put other contingencies on this motion. That is absolutely fine. What I'm hearing is that there be a motion to postpone. 
The question now is, is there a motion to postpone to a date certain or uh, just a motion to postpone that would put it on November 7th. But if there's a motion to postpone because you want conditions like um, the weighing in of the Board of Health or for consideration by the regional school district, then that is another different motion. So the floor is at this point, the motion is on the floor. It's been made and seconded. Michelle? What are the um, potential negative consequences of, of postponing? Like how much time does this, and I'm sorry, I don't have the exact timeline in front of me. But I'm, personally, I, I'll ask Sean that. I'm sure. not going to try to answer it personally. Yeah, I mean, I think I think a couple things. Um, there is the deadline um, of January, I think, 16th. So that's the deadline the school committee set in order to raise the funds. Um, I think delaying it, does make it harder probably for the fundraising. If there's, um, I think the fundraising is around a specific model, option three. Um, if there's uncertainty whether the town is gonna come up with its share, that sort of, you know, sidetracks the fundraising efforts. Um, that being said, there are, there's no funds raised yet. So, um, but I do think it makes it difficult to get that going. Michelle, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank okay. you. Jennifer? Um, yeah, I mean, if we, so I would have to make a separate motion. I mean, I would like to hear the Board of Health's recommendations if, if we could request it in a time frame that we wouldn't, um, that we could still meet the, the January fundraising deadline. I mean, it's October. If um, I don't know if this is, Michelle, you're the liaison. I don't know if you would know to the Board of Health if this is something they've been discussing, but if we could ask for their, um opinion 30 days from now i, I don't know it, um what exactly the protocol for that would be um let me try the following okay um i'm gonna try it as a motion and i'm gonna look for athena to help me correct it i move to postpone the motion made and seconded last evening with regard to the track and field. Um, through November 21st at 6.30. Is there a second? Oh, second. Okay, let me explain my motion. And that is, I move to move it till then, and then working with the town um, manager, uh, see what we can learn from the Board of Health so that by the time we come back, that gives them a month to meet, discuss, and perhaps even the school district can discuss. And that gives us a month, but them a month, but also means we revisit it in a reasonable amount of time. Dorothy? Um, I just wanted to clarify, uh, when looking at motions to postpone, I guess it was last night, um, it said one, the reason to one could entertain a motion to postpone is when you need to get additional information. Yeah. So this sounds like a legitimate request to postpone. Right. That's, all. That's correct. Okay. Michelle? What was the date, Lynn? November 21st. That's the That's our second meeting in November. Okay, the Board of Health meets again on November 10th, just to keep that in mind. That's Excellent. the next meeting. Excellent. Thank you. Andy? Yeah, um, the only suggestion I'd make on the wording of the motion, instead of saying uh, track and field, I would say appropriation and transfer order FY2305C. I, I accept that as a friendly amendment. Uh, who seconded? Jennifer? Yeah, second. And you accept that as a friendly yes. amendment. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I'm going to move to a vote. And the vote is to postpone to November 21st. And um, I'm going to start with Shelley Bonham. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Dellen Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers. Aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. 
Anika Lopes is not here. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney is not here. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Thank you. We've concluded the votes. We're going to move to public comment. This will be the first of two public comments. It's particularly public comment related to the full town council business. And I see two hands. And the first one is Vera Cage. We are going to stick to a three minute time limit. And although we may not have a clock up, I'm going to use my handy phone alarm. So I'm sorry if you hear the alarm go off. Vera, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, Vera Cage, 12 Longmeadow Drive, apartment 21, Amherst, Mass, 01002. I attended last night's town council meeting and um, I listened to the statement today of the town council member who um, made the motion to suspend um, the vote um, to this particular meeting. I'm going to uh, share your statement, um, town councilor Haneke, and I wanna be able to count the words that you were able to come up with to describe your pain, your feeling of being unsafe, of being unsupported. And I'm gonna compare the number of words you were able to describe your situation for the nine members of the Amherst Nine when that comes up again. Because they too feel unsafe, they too feel pain, they too have suffered, they too have been harmed. So I'd like for you to consider what they may be going through when they were stopped and detained and they were not allowed to move freely even after the situation was determined that this was not a group of teens that were causing mayhem in the community. You heard Chief Livingstone say that he would do it again. You heard Chief Livingstone say that he felt that that was the right thing to do. So basically parents, of our children who resemble, who look, who may be these teens can expect from the Amherst police that their child, their teen is not safe to move freely in their own hometown, in their home community, in their neighborhoods, in the place where they live. That is what I heard from Chief Livingstone. I appreciate that the diversity, equity, and inclusion officer included a parent's name in the, her report. I've since spoken to that parent and I'm not sure which parent of the two that the police or the DEI is asserting that they've reached out to that supported the actions of the police. And I will leave my comments at that. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. The other hand that is up is Philip Avila, who is a member of the CSSJC and co-chair of the Human Rights Commission. Philip, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello, can you hear me? We can. My name is Philip Avila, uh, five feet in Fort. I have had really no intention on speaking until uh, this statement was read. So I just want this narrative of a motion needing to be thought of, of groups coming together from town appointed committees to discuss to enact an advisory type of 
statement or advice to the town council with town lawyers that needing more time to decide that you need to think about that. You need to think about that. We need committees outside of the majority white town council dealing with a BIPOC issue that it would be majority BIPOC groups coming together to advise white town councilors on this issue. That is going to be the definition of white supremacy. What you did last night was white supremacy. You silence BIPOC individuals into your privilege of enacting such article and your privilege of your whiteness to allow that to happen. I want the town councilors to really reflect on that. I want the town councilors to really ask themselves, are they doing enough to fight against their privilege of inequalities? Because what happened last night was unequal. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. I see no other hands for public comment. Therefore, I'm going to turn the meeting back over to Andy. And Andy, it's your turn to chair. Well, thank you. I'm returning to my role as a finance committee member. Thank you. So what we're going to do next is um, that uh, one of the two major agenda items that I had cited earlier was uh, to hear from Sean Mangano, but also want to offer uh, town manager an opportunity to speak at any, uh, if you'd like to uh, take this first. Uh, we had uh, uh, been looking at various models for how we could fund for major building projects uh, because of changed circumstances that have been presented to the committee in a prior meeting. We know that we need to think about um, different alternatives on how to approach um, the um, goal of funding the four major projects in the future. Um, and uh, so the purpose of today's uh, meeting, uh, this section of today's meeting, is to present those alternatives that um, were identified and uh, then to uh, have questions from the council and the committee regarding that. So um, what I will be doing um, after the presentation is to um, recognize any member of the committee or the council in the order that I see hands go up. And um, because today is to understand the uh, presentation that's been made and the choices before us, it is not the intention of the finance committee to actually make a recommendation today, but um, because this is the first step of uh, just understanding what our options might be. So with that, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, town manager if he has anything he wants to say first. Sure, thank you, Andy. Uh, and Sean will be going through a set of slides that will um, outline where we are, some assumptions that we've built into uh, the work. Uh, I recognize that Sonia is here as well and value her insight is to, into this. Um, you know, the world has changed a lot since the last time we started to make projections on the four capital projects. Our mission continues to be, um, until we hear otherwise, that we want to move forward on all four capital projects. We wanna lay out to you some scenarios in which we think they can move forward. Um, with that being said, we do recognize that the world continues to change. We don't know what is going on with inflation. We do not no, nobody knows what's going on with uh, interest rates. We've tried to build those um, buffers in. So we, the, the presentation we're making to you today, um, we think are achievable under today's circumstances. So with that, I would turn it over to Sean to go through the, the set of slides. Thank you. Okay, can you see the uh, presentation on the screen? So just to uh, reiterate what we talked about at the council meeting a couple of weeks ago, we tried to sort of develop, reframe how we want to evaluate things are things we talked about, some of them are new, but a quick recap. The first one is urgency. 
Um, how quickly can we complete all four projects? Impact on bond rating, which is really, um, our bond rating is very complex in terms of how it gets determined, but some of the key uh, levers within our bond rating that are impacted by capital are our budgetary flexibility, uh, liquidity, and debt service. And, and that's debt services are annual debt costs versus total outstanding debt, which is the aggregate of all of our debt. Overall costs, so some some options cost more than others. Uh, so if we, you know, if we incur debt for an option and it's over 30 years, that's going to cost more than if we incur debt for an option over 20 years because the the interest is is more expensive. However, when you spread it out over 30 years, you've it's a smaller chunk each year, so it makes it a little more manageable each year. Uh, other capital funding, how much can we continue to set aside for the other capital needs in town, vehicle replacements, building maintenance, things of that nature. Uh, usage of reserves. So uh, last night, the council voted to establish the, the capital stabilization fund, which was really helpful um, in, in moving this process forward. And you voted to move about $9.3 million into that capital stabilization fund. Um, so now we have a number that we can look to and say, that's how much we currently have. You'll see some options today propose using more than that, and which means we would have to use that fund and build it up over a number of years to achieve those models. And then flexibility, uh, to Paul's point, we try to build in, well, each model does a different it does a different does this differently, but there's ways to build in more flexibility into each model, meaning um, if interest rates rise, is there something else we can adjust so that we can continue with that model? Um, so if we're very cons if this model is more conservative, there's more room for things to change for the worse and still move forward. If we're very aggressive with a model, meaning we sort of max out, you know, try to get every piece of cost savings we can to make it work. If things get worse from that point, there's really nowhere to go, and the model's kind of kind of defunct at that point. So we try to build in a certain level of flexibility, but some models have So just some basic uh, sort of fundamentals about the models that we're going to look at. So in all cases, we've uh, assigned these total project costs to the um, to the different projects. So for the fire, we've assigned 20 million. That's up from when we first started this process. We had uh, started with 15, so that's been raised up to 20. Uh, public works, we started at 20. We've raised that up to 30. Um, the Jones Library is still at 15.8 because that's what's been approved. And the interest rate that we're assuming is 4% right now. Um, to Paul's point, that's changing every day as, as people look, you know, hear negative news from the Fed um, about what they're doing and that has an impact on what we're doing. The school project we're assuming will be funded through debt exclusion. So you won't see much on the schools here because um, because it's going to be funded through a separate revenue source if it's approved. So really the focus here is how do we make the other three projects work using our existing uh, funds. The four models that we're going to look at, the first one just called it baseline to, to show what if we did um, sort of used roughly the, the reserves we currently have in hand, kept our capital funding at 10% of the um, tax levy, which was our original goal. And if we set aside three and a half million for other capital needs, which is a, uh, a, a larger amount than what we were anticipating before that we feel that will fund our, our other capital needs at a, a better level. The second model is what if we don't use any reserves, if we wanna keep the reserves we built up as sort of that buffer that I talked about, um, in order to make that work, we would have to increase capital funding as a percentage of the levy and we'd have to uh, reduce how much we set aside for other capital needs. And you'll see what that looks like. And then the last two, what if we try to use the capital stabilization fund as a, as a piggy bank that we build up so that we can just outright pay for a project and not borrow for it? Um, that significantly reduces the debt that we take on, but it also reduces our reserves in a big chunk all at once. And so you'll see what that looks like if we were to try to do that for the fire station, um, which costs 20 million, or if we were to try to do that for the Jones Library, um, which costs about 15.8, but we would still have to pay for some of the um, the short-term financing costs for the Jones Library, and there's some other costs there that we'd have to cover. So in either circumstance, it comes out to about 20 million of reserves that we would have to have in order to do that. Any questions on so the baseline before I start diving into the models? Kathy has a question. 
than Bob Hegner in that order. Yes, you are. Okay, um, Sean, I let you go into your modeling, but I looked at this last night and I want to raise the question on all of school is debt finance, is debt service um, and, and the timing because uh, for a couple of things we're, we're still assuming and, and I do understand Paul and Sean that this is coming from the council that we're doing all four and we're doing all four kind of in the same time period. We've also got another assumption that fire has to be where DPW is. So therefore we have to find another place for DPW. We could revisit those, those are working assumptions. And I don't know whether the DPW cost, it went from 20 to 30 million rather than from 20 to 25 million. I don't know how much of that is because the price of buying a piece of land to put it on, since we don't have a piece of land to put it on, is driving it up. So I want to come back to some of those after you go through the modeling, because I could imagine a different kind of process where fire, for example, went down. We own Hickory Ridge. We own some developable property there. We said we could sequence it differently. They don't have to be coming online at the same time. And we could use some of this capital reserve for school. I know we can't fall fund all of school from internal, but I'm looking to lower the amount we need to raise from taxes. So that will be too much for tonight's discussion, but I think calling in some of the basic assumptions going in of making sure people understand this is assuming DPW and fire are rolling out over this time period and school is all debt service, um, debt exclusion. And that is a decision we can make and it's a working assumption we have made, but I'd like to come back to it. And the same thing with this DPW has to find a new place, so fire has to go where DPW is, because I think we could stage the construction differently if that was not the situation. So uh, I'll just enough said, because I noticed that fire went up by 5 million, but DPW went up by 10 million in your revised number. So it's getting back up there as a pretty expensive project. That's it. Yeah. Um can I quickly respond yeah. to that, Andy? Yeah. Sure. Um, I think the point you raised, the first point you raised is one I just want to reiterate, which again, all these models are based on the, the directive that we've received to what are uh, ways to do all four. Um, I think when you look at these models, you know, your reaction, I think, is a reasonable one based on just where we are economically now. Um, if, if there's a different direction that says, look at some, try to propose some models that do something different, we can do that as well. Um, but to, to your original point, these all are, how do we do all four? Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Sean, if you could go back to the previous slide, I'm a little confused about how much of, in these, each, each of these four options, how much are we actually borrowing? You said, I, I thought you said we would not borrow anything for any of these scenarios. Is that correct or? Nope, we would we would borrow. Um, okay. so, so how much are we borrowing under each one? So in the baseline option, we're borrowing for all three projects. So the um, sort of the t the face value of what we would borrow would be the twenty million for the fire station plus the thirty million for public works plus the fifteen point eight. Um, so roughly sixty uh, sixty five point okay. eight million. Um, that's the same for uh, model number two. The difference for number three and number four is that um, in number three, we wouldn't borrow for the fire station. So it would be just the public works plus the library. And for number four, we wouldn't borrow for the library. So it would just be the, the fire station and public works. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I will go to, the, so I'm gonna go through these charts kind of quickly, but I'll, I'll go through this first one very slowly. Um, but I think the, the table at the end is sort of the comparison, which I'll, I'll spend more time on. So this may be a little small, but this is the tool that you've seen in the past that has different um, levers. So we've plugged in the assumptions for the baseline, which is the sort of the, the one fixed thing that is in all of these models 
is the library debt because we have a, a debt authorization approved the library and, and the amount of um, 15.8 million. We've worked with our financial advisor to model that out using um, assumptions around the fundraising and CPA. And so we have a good debt schedule for the Jones Library that includes short-term interest. So if you look at the purple bar, it might be difficult to see, but you'll see a couple bigger years at the beginning, um, 2026 and 2027 that are larger than the other years. That's because those years have a lot of short-term interest, um, which is needed in order to keep the project moving while fundraising comes in and historical tax credits come in. So that's all been baked into the, to the library debt in this, this scenario. Uh, the, the fire station has, um, again, the price tag of 20 million. This model proposes it is showing that starting in 2035 and it would be a 30 year borrowing at 4%. The public works building is at the 30 million that we discussed that would start in 2030 in this option. And again, these years are based, you know, you change the year changes how far above the line you are, the more you space it out, the less you are above the line. Um, in this situation, that black line is the amount of funding that we have from capital. Uh, the black line is the per equals the amount um, that is the percentage of the tax levy that we dedicate to capital. So right now it's at 10%. If we change that number um, to 10.5%, that black line would move up a little bit. If we changed it to 9%, it would drop down. And that line determines how far above or below uh, funding we have, or how, how the funding, how far the bars are above that black line or below that black line is how close we are to funding it. Um, and again, the school you won't see on here because at least in this model, we're proposing it to be funded through a debt exclusion. This chart looks at what can we do with our existing capital funds, not the funds to be raised through a debt exclusion. So the, the, the quick takeaway is with these assumptions, 10% of the tax levy for capital, setting aside three and a half million uh, for other capital needs, which is made up by those yellow uh, bars that you see there, that's ongoing capital. Um, and then you'll see we also have built in our debt, which are those green bars at the bottom. That's an assumption around the, the debt that we'll have to continue to pay for other capital needs. Um, we would have to space these out quite a bit in order to make it feasible. And that's why last time we spoke, I think I said, you know, our horizon for what is quick for these four projects is gonna have to stretch out. And this is an example of what that, that meant. Any questions on this model? The one, you know, one positive about this model, I'll say it does not do very well in the urgency category. Uh, but one positive is that, you know, there's no years where the yellow bars are are way above, um, are way above the, you know, the funding that we have available, which means in those particular years, you know, we could choose to use reserves. Maybe we we would pull back on a, a funding for their capital needs. There might be other things to that could be manipulated um, to make it work more easily because there's not. I think the biggest year maybe is a million dollars over and you'll see in some of the other options it's there's bigger years than that so sean are you saying this the, this model one is not using any of the reserves even though we've got nine and a half million in a capital reserve so it, right it, now this okay. it theoretically would um so say we okay. didn't you know if we did want to keep everything all the assumptions the way they are you know three and a half million for their capital needs we would have to use a little bit of the reserves each year and that totals the 11.8 million in the bottom left hand corner so it would use all it would use all of what we have currently plus a little bit more but it's over a longer period of time so there's there's room for that to to be built up okay so I'm gonna go, so that's the baseline model one. There's not really any reason for calling it baseline other than there's the first one I worked on. Uh, so model two, a low reserve use. So this, Kathy, is more what you were just talking about. What if we wanted to pursue an option that we didn't lock in use of any of our reserves? We wanted to hold that back and keep it in case, you know, interest rates come in higher or there's an economic downturn and we can't fund capital at the same percentage for as long um, to protect those reserves longer. So to do that, we would have to drop down the funding that we set aside for other capital needs to 3 million. In the first model, it was three and a half. Um, so those yellow bars are a little bit smaller in this chart. We would have to increase the percentage of the tax levy that we dedicate to capital. Um, up to 10.5%. The first model, it was 10%. So that moves that black line up. 
and and I think everything else is pretty much the same. The, the amount of money we set aside for other capital needs is a uh, variable that has a big impact. Because if you can imagine 500,000 on an annual basis, it adds up to a lot. So that, that is one of the key variables that we'll want to look at. So Kathy? Yeah, okay, just um, at a future point, you, you, with the 10.5% for the tax levy, you showed us once a year or two years ago what that does to the amount left for operating budgets. Um, I just want to do that squeezes operating budgets um, during that time period, correct? I, so it it does more than if we didn't do it. So if if we go to 10.5%, let's say for FY24, uh, we'll be working on the financial indicators, uh, the presentation soon. If we go to 10.5%, that half percent that we're going up could have gone to operating budgets or something else. Um, now that's not to say we won't still be able to do two and a half percent for operating budgets because it's driven by our revenues, state aid, um, new growth, and, and other local receipts. Um, but it is a choice to put more into capital versus some other place. So just we're almost there. You know, when we first looked at this, I think we were we were uh, right before the pandemic. I think we might have been around ten, but then we dropped down. But now we're back up to ten. So it's not as big of a jump now to go to ten and a half. But the, the, the one theme for all these models is we have to be disciplined and have to stick to whatever we set aside for capital for a long time. So when we had the pandemic, we, we, capital was one of the areas we looked to for a very short term, but we looked to, um, to kind of cushion the impacts of the pandemic. If we were locked in on this moving forward, we, we wouldn't really have that flexibility or we would have to do like no other capital at all. Um, but that is another a key point to remember is that if once we start going down this road and um, and moving forward with, with the DPW and the fire station start locking in those projects, we really have to stick to the to what we set aside for capital. Um, there's really no other choice. All right, so model three is the if we wanted to use the capital stabilization fund. Um, you know, as a reserve that we're going to build up. And when it gets to a certain point, that's when we would move forward with the fire station. Um, I, one of the things I like about this option, there's a few things I like about this, this concept. We don't incur as much debt. So that's, that's helpful um, for our, our bond rating. One thing to mention in all these circumstances, we're maintaining 15% of reserves for, for rainy days or for economic downturns. That's the policy we discussed last night where um, we're only looking at the reserves above and beyond that. So, um, so we would have this capital stabilization fund and we would build it up over time. And when we had the money in place, that's when we would move forward with that project. Um, so it's making sure that we have the money in hand. It doesn't put as much stress um, on, the, on the operating budget or on the, the funds set aside for capital because we would be building up a pot of money uh, specifically for a project. So in this one, um, you'll see the fire station has been uh, taken off the chart because it wouldn't come from our, our funds for capital. It'd come out of that capital stabilization fund, which would be a separate source. Um, so you see the fire department will come off this chart. Uh, we have the 30 million for the DPW in 2030. And the Jones Library project stays the same. And this assumes 10.5% for um, capital and 3 million for other capital needs. Bob? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, make sure I'm understanding the graph. So in all of these four models, at a certain point in time, in this one, it's about 2033, I guess, we start to see that the total expenses for the four projects plus the three point other, in this case, it's the three million for other capital needs is falling behind below the 10.5% line. Does that mean that there's essentially more uh, available, more cash available, you know, more uh, tax levy available for other things? 
Yeah. So with the with this line, the line grows because it's based on the tax levy, and so we have a, right. a conservative assumption that the tax levy will increase two and a half percent per year. It could increase more than that. Um, so there's potential with, with new development and new growth. The black line will increase faster than what you see here. Um, there's also the potential if there's a you know if there's a downturn of some sort that it could flatten out in some years as well. Um, but sort of the general assumptions that it will to be conservative, it was, we've built in a two and a half percent increase. So that's why it slowly grows. Um, so yeah, at a certain point, if it continues to grow and if you look back, you'll see kind of where we used to be. So it's, it kind of pans out that it does grow over time. Um, at a certain point, it'll grow to where we'll then have more flexibility under uh, with our existing capital resources. Right, so so just to, to, to make sure I understand. So basically under in this particular model, we'd have sort of a, a crunch period up until about 2033, 20, 2030, 20, well, 30, can't read these, uh, 31, 32, something yep. about that. Then after that, we'd have more flexibility. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and this model in particular, I think um, through 2029 would be okay because we would just have the Jones Library project on the books at that point. The really crunch years to your point would be the 2030 through 2033 or so, because that's when we would have the Jones Library plus the DPW. Um, so there'd be a, a little bit less flexibility in those four years. And then if things continue to grow, um, we, we would get back into a, a more comfortable place. All right, and then the last one um, is if we use our reserves to um, fund the the, the Jones Library instead of the fire station. So in this model, the reason why it's it's still 20 million, um, we would still need 20 million of reserves, um, even though the Jones Library is only cost 15.8, is because this model you can see is three million dollars above the line. So we would need reserves to cover that that three million dollars, um, plus the 15.8 million for the the building itself, plus um, some money for the for the short-term borrowings for that project while fundraising and, and historical tax credits come in. So it comes out to about the same number as in the fire station. It just gets used over a different period of time. Um, so this one, uh, it, it allows us to move things maybe forward a little bit more. I think that's the, the key difference with this model. Um, so the, the DPW in this option, we start in 2025. Uh, this projects to in the fire station in 2029 and the the library would stay on its same schedule but we would have to um, increase our reserves in the next you know two to three years to be able to pay for that uh, we'd have to get our reserves up in the next two to three years to be able to cover the the cost of the jones library project and the related um, debt service costs um, the some of the three million we wouldn't need until 2029 2030 that's the, those are the big years where there's some reserves needed for the rest of this model, um, but we would need to at least get to about uh, 16 or 17 million um, in the next three years in order to fund the initial wave of reserves in this model. Kath? Um, building on Bob's question on the black line that's going up, where we get to our buildings are below the back line. In those years, can we start to spend more on other capital needs? So, you know, if I take the difference, you know, scrunching my eyes, you know, am I still going to be live in some of these years would not be another question. <laughs> but if I get out to 2037, where we're below your line, we're basically starting to build up reserves again, the way I understand what that line is. And so we could be drawing on them for other capital needs. Um, so this flat 3 million, I'm, I'm trying to understand this. So it, I should ask it as a question. So could we start to spend more than 3 million in those years? Um, and, yeah. and and I know it's a simple model, so you can't say we're going to spend three for four of the years and we're going to spend 3.5 for five of the years or something. But is that is that a correct interpretation of the space below the amount we're accumulating? Yeah, yeah. So you could spend more. You could also, in those years, you could use it to build up reserves more, to build up the capital stabilization fund um, to help down the road. 
Um, again, the, the, the three million or three and a half million for other capital needs, again, it's just used for these models to kind of set aside a rough amount. That, that amount will fluctuate year to year when we actually go through the capital planning process. So, you know, there could be ways when we look at these models where maybe in the early years, that's a little bit lower to build up that capital stabilization fund even more. Um, but you're right, any, your, your interpretation of the chart is correct. Any years that you see below the black line, you could theoretically do more for capital or you could, or you could reduce how much we don't recommend sort of playing around with that very much. And I guess just, I uh, see Matt's got his hand up too, but could you, uh, the school's not here at all, but could you um, pay down, prepay some of your debt? So if you actually, if this world was the world we're living in, uh, uh, the way you pay off a mortgage instead of a 30 year mortgage, you get it down to 25. So does, in those out years, is there some flexibility? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay, yep. thank yeah, you. There's, there's every, um, th there's, there's um, some restrictions on what we can do, but there's usually always some debt we could pay down. Um, and we would look for the ones with the highest interest rates to start with. Matt? So I may have uh, misheard this or missed it, but your um, assumption for the ongoing capital, I heard you say 3.5. Uh, that doesn't doesn't quite look like 3.5, but is that is this an inflationary, like what just, what's the rule? Yeah, so the, the three and a half also grows. So it's three and a half in the, the initial year, and then that grows by two and a half percent each year as well. So we're, we've built in a little bit of an inflationary factor into what we've set aside for other capital as well, thinking that prices will go up and it'll sort of go uh, the same rate as what we have for capital. Um, so yeah, the yellow bar definitely gets bigger as it goes on. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of conservatism in that, that we are assuming that that amount grows a little bit each year. Um, and the other thing to remember is this also, that three and a half million does not include debt for other capital needs. So the green bars there, um, have all the debt for all the projects that have been approved already, like the ladder truck, um, or really anything that's on our five-year capital plan, um, even if it hasn't been approved yet, we've modeled the debt and included it here in the green bar. Um, so for example, I think like the Crocker Farm roof is on there um, several years out. We've modeled that debt and included it here so that we're trying to get you know as close to a, um, a good debt number. So I know the three million, three and a half million sounds tight, but it's separate from the debt that's already been approved. And there's an estimate of debt going forward. So there's a little bit of room there. Okay, thank you. And then my other question is, this is looking 15 years out. Um, do you have a sense of, you know, 15 years back in terms of ongoing capital costs? What kind of, you know, growth um, or, or I don't know, what kind of patterns we see in, in looking backwards at capital outlay? Yeah, so we've, it, it's all sort of dictated by, you know, what we set aside for capital. So when we look back, there's been different years where we've um, we've tried to ramp up what we set aside for capital over the last 10 years. There was a time when it was a very small number, and, and Sonia may be able to fill and provide some of the context. But there was a time when it, you know, it was probably closer to 5 or 6% of the levy, if not smaller, that was set aside for capital. Um, and... And now we've intentionally tried to grow it partially to prepare for this, but also partially just because we, we felt we needed to put more into capital um, and to, to maintain our assets. So, so it's sort of a function of, of how much we say is available, but we can look at the, the prior year capital plans and sort of add up the totals that were on there um, to, to get a sense. So uh, almost done with the, chart on the slide. So this table sort of compares those, the four models that you just looked at using the different criteria that um, were identified at the beginning. So urgency, the first two models get all four projects completed in the 2030s. And the reason why I'm kind of broad there is I don't want people to get stuck on a specific year because all these things can fluctuate a little bit forward or backwards um, depending on how things go. So model one and model two, you know, you're talking about next decade, model three and model four, we're thinking late this decade. Um, impact on bond rating. So model one has the highest impact because we're using a, a big chunk of our reserves. We're also taking on a lot of debt um, and, and 
debt long into the future. Um, that's why that one has the highest uh, impact. All of them have an impact. The, the, the reason why the next three, and there's no science to this, but the reason why the next three are sort of in the medium range is because there's a little bit of wiggle room in terms of its impact. So model two doesn't use a big chunk of our reserves. Um, that's a positive thing for our, our bond rating, give, uh, keeps flexibility for us. Um, model three and model four don't take on as much debt. So that's why those have a little bit less of an impact. Um, overall costs. So the first two models, you're talking around 110 million. Um, model three about in the 90s, and then model four about 105, 106. Um, and the big differentiate, differentiator here is the, the fire station. That's a larger project. You're paying for it outright. You're not incurring interest costs on that for as long. But uh, you're also pulling 20 million out, right. 20 million out of reserves. And right now we've got a reserve fund with nine and a half million in it. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Other capital funds, so the first model sets aside three and a half, the next three are three, so um, the mo first model from that perspective is the, the best one. Usage of reserves, to Kathy's point, how much are we pulling out? So model one pulls out roughly what we currently have, model two really doesn't pull out any reserves, and then model three and model four would pull out about 20 million total, so we would have work to do to build those, that fund up um, in order to make those models possible. And then the last one, flexibility. So uh, model one and model two, we've put it medium. Um, the first one, because we uh, only set aside 10% of the levy for capital, we didn't max out, you know, we didn't go up to 10 and a half. Um, and we also kept the amount of money for other capital needs at three and a half million um, instead of three million. So that's a, a, a positive thing in terms of flexibility to move up and down. Um, model two, obviously there's some flexibility because of using less reserves. Uh, model three and model four, very low flexibility because we're we're using a lot of reserves um, and and we're still incurring some debt and we're uh, at least one of those options was at 10 and a half percent, 10 and a half percent of the of the tax levy for capital. And they also drop down our other capital funding down to 3 million. So there's not much room to go much. We don't, we don't want to go much lower than that. Um, so those two on the flexibility front are quite low. And then trying to wrap my head around this a little bit, um, I put together this little chart that's sort of the, the, the two levers that these models look at are um, how much reserve use do we um, deploy and, and or versus how much debt do we take on? And there's pros and cons um, to each of those. So if you're in the starting with the, the bottom square, the lower left, if we don't use a lot of debt and we don't um, use a lot of our reserves, um, it's great from a financial standpoint, uh, purely financial standpoint, um, but it would, you know, we would never complete the projects. Um, we have four projects that have been delayed for many decades that need to get done. Um, and the only way to get them done in a, you know, a reasonable time span is to do some combination of debt and reserves. Um, but it does maintain a lot of flexibility. Um, going up, so if we use a lot of reserves, um, going to the top left-hand uh, square there, if we use a lot of reserves, um, we will have lower overall costs because we're not incurring as much debt, not incurring uh, the debt service uh, charges. We may be able to complete the projects a little bit more quickly, not the, uh, not the quickest way, but a little bit more quickly. Um, it'll allow us to have more funding for other capital needs because again, we're not incurring debt, so we're not taking a chunk of uh, the funds set aside for the, um, for the, from the tax levy which would go towards debt. We're not doing that since we're using more reserves. Um, and it would help us lower what we have to set aside for capital because again, we're not pulling as much debt out of that. Um, but it, uh, the major con is that it really hinders our flexibility to respond to any type of emergency. Going to the lower right-hand side, if we use a lot of debt, not a lot of reserves. Um, so we keep more flexibility because we have those reserves. Um, Again, we can complete the projects a little bit more quickly than if we didn't use debt or reserves. Um, but the cons are we're, we're going to have higher overall costs because we're borrowing for all the projects. Um, we're going to have less funding for other capital needs because a big chunk of what we set aside for capital is going to go towards debt. And we may have to push up what we set aside for capital. And then obviously using, uh, going to the top right, if we use a lot of reserves and a lot of debt, um, that's sort of the, um, it gets the projects done the fastest. Uh, but from a financial standpoint, it's the worst. Um, so. I know this is probably all obvious stuff, but I think what we're thinking about is 
where do we land on here um, when we're looking at the different models and it's probably you know, we want to be in a balanced place. Alicia. Um, thank you, Sean. I'm just wondering where or how we're coming up with the um, total project cost assumptions um, and if those take into consideration fluctuation and things like interest rates and inflation and um, if we have taken into consideration what or how each model would be affected if any of the projects come in higher than what we have as projected? No, that's a great question. So these are the assumptions that we've used right now. Um, the model, that's one of the reasons why we built in the flexibility criteria for exactly what you said. Um, so a model that is, doesn't have a lot of flexibility is going to be really negatively impacted by if things come in higher or if interest rates worsen, um, which is, that's why we're gauging that. Um, but for now, we've put the fire station at 20 and public works at 30. Uh, we're trying to work with our designer to get some um, updated numbers for those two projects. But again, those two projects, we do not have detailed schematic designs or, or detailed cost estimates. So they're they're really high level figures at this point, and we would have to work to develop a project to those numbers. Um, the Jones Library numbers, uh, we do have a detailed cost estimate for, and, and again, the school's not shown here, but we we do have a more detailed cost estimate for. Um, this interest rate is roughly where interest rates are right now. Um, they've been trending up significantly, so this could get worse, and that would impact the feasibility of any of the, the models. Um, but that's something we can we can adjust. Um, thank you. So then my follow-up would be, um, so there is a possibility that if we, or if and when we have more information that these, that this like model template could be updated and that we may not actually fall into any of these? Yeah, no, I, I think, so what we put these up, we put sort of different options out there today because we're really looking for your feedback on comfort level with using a lot of reserves or comfort level taking on a lot of debt. And the hope today was to get your input on, or maybe not comfortable with any of them, right? That could be an option too. Um, and we're looking for that feedback to then maybe move into one direction more or the other and get into more details. Um, but I, I, it's, your point is right, which is there could be a completely different option that ends up being pursued. Um, or it could be a variation of what you've looked at today. Okay, thank you. So this is just like a base starting point. We expect this to develop further. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Lynn? Do you, have you finished the presentation? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Questions, comments? All right. Um, First of all, thank you. Uh, the modeling is um, an art and a science. So you've done an amazing job of laying this out. And I really want to say how valuable uh, this is for all of us and um, how valuable you are to us to be able to do this. Um, the, my, one of my bigger questions all along has been, and I have a couple, whether there's any way to take a different project and I'm, you know, for all my years of working to build a new fire station, this sounds like heresy, but is there any way to take a different project like the fire station out for a debt exclusion so that we could reduce what we have to borrow, or I'm sorry, what we have to ask the taxpayers for, for the school? Because that's my overall goal is trying to do that and, and is trying to find and, and just, you know, for everybody here, we're working but legislatively now on both trying to get more money from the school, from the legislature and trying to get more money from the legislature for the library. So none of those efforts are in these models. Uh, I want to just be clear about that, but it doesn't mean we're not working on it. So in other words, take out, take the, the fire station out for debt exclusion in a way that allows us to do something 
that's one thing. And we're not going to sit here today and model it, but I would not be true to my thinking if I didn't raise that question. Another issue that I think comes up for me because it comes up for Pats in my district and every other district in town, and that is the issue of our other capital demands, namely streets and sidewalks. And it's just so out there. Uh, I'm dreading winter. I just don't know what, whether our streets can take it. So I'm concerned about that. And we're hearing even from constituents that I don't feel like I can vote for the school with the roads in front of my house and the condition they're in. So that to me does raise the issue of how many, res how much reserves, how much are we spending on other capital? And are we truly in that other capital? Is there ever a point where we can get ahead of the curve on roads and sidewalks? Because I just feel like we're losing ground every day on roads and sidewalks. So those are my two biggest uh, questions and I'll stop with that. So um, we, we could do a debt exclusion for the fire station separate vote and you know separate townwide vote and a separate decision um the thing to remember with debt exclusions is is there the town is giving permission to incur debt um so you can't say necessarily you can provide provide information but unless you're gonna um let's say the fire station if you wanted to do that debt exclusion for the full cost of it um again that would just go out to them for a vote but say you only want to do half uh the way you fund that other half you may or may not be able to communicate that to taxpayers with um, with assurance. So if you were gonna take the other half and still borrow for it um, coming from the tax levy, the town is still gonna to have to vote on the full amount. But if you were to take the other half and pay for it from reserves instead, then you would reduce the debt authorization. So you could more positively say in that circumstance, the debt authorization for the fire station is only 10 million um, as opposed to 20 million. So sorry, that got kind of wonky, but, um, but just think about when you do bring out the fire station, how are you bringing out the full amount or a portion of it and how you pay for that other portion impacts how you package it for taxpayers to consider. Um, and then your second question was on the, um, was on the roads and sidewalks. So we've tried to really invest heavily in roads and sidewalks the past few years. I hope we're not falling behind. I hope, <laughs> I hope we're making progress because we've increased the allocation um, up $2 million. And we've done a couple of years with extra allocations now with the one that was approved last night. And, and last year, we've put an extra $2 million into it. Um, but your point is right, which is when we do have less to set aside for capital, there's going to be a tighter squeeze. And so if you want to maintain a large investment in roads, that's going to mean less available for other capital needs for buildings and vehicles and things of that nature. Um, and, and there's a give and take there. And so I just... I understand the voter question, and we, we're going to get into that with the schools um, in terms of it. So, what, But what you're saying is, unless we just take a chunk right out of reserves, we still have to say to the voters, will you spend X to build a fire station? Whatever the debt authorization is, is what they're, um, yeah. they're saying yes or no to. Yeah. Well, and this is, a, this is an educational process that the council is going to be going through um, actually very soon very soon <laughs> exactly so uh, because of how we do the schools thank you again sean uh bob it's okay yeah, if i just call, so, on, call on people andy yes okay okay so um the the concern i have in looking at the models is how far are we stretching out the construction of the DPW facility and the fire station and what's going to happen in between. But that's my concern is that if we stretch it out too far, they're, they're going to collapse <laughs> and we're going to have to do something. So there's a, there's going to be a limit as to how far we can push those projects into the future. And maybe we should try to have some sense of what that 
you know, what that is. I mean, if that's a reality, that that's a reality. And let's sit down and look at what the implications of that are, rather than just say, well, we can postpone the fire station until 20, start building it until 2035 or something like that, um, which may not be realistic. No, you're absolutely right. I think in, in those circumstances where they're pushed out that far, it's going to require an investment in those buildings to get them there. Um, similarly, with what we did with Wildwood and Fort River, there's been a continued investment in those buildings to keep them going. Um, there would have to be that and, you know, both the public works building and the fire station to get them to, to some of those models in the years that they're shown. Kathy? I want to build on Lynn's uh, both idea and suggestion in a slightly different way. You know, I I know we can't do the school all internally um, because of the size, but if we could pull five million out of our reserves, and then you know, I've been looking at what our share is going to be, so that what the debt exclusion would be lower that we need to get from the taxpayers. And then what you just said for the fire, have it be partially a debt exclusion. So it, it's a more complex modeling, but I think it's just math on, mm -hmm. is there some combination looking at it? Because the one that's coming up is schools. Um, as Bob said, we can't wait very long on the other buildings they are gonna collapse, but we are going to have to come up with our share as a town of the school once we go to the MSBA and uh, they determine their share. So lowering it, um, we Sean is not showing us, but there are internal models that show for each $10 million of debt exclusion, what does that mean for the taxpayer? Um, and so there's a big difference if you can get it down by 10 million rather than have it all go out. Um, so I, I just, uh, but I don't want to have that discussion tonight, but I feel like it's, uh, we have to have it really soon. And it should probably be a long discussion on, you know, what kind of choices are we willing or trying to make? We know, we're going to have enough information to be talking about it in November. Um, so just scheduling a chunk of time, Andy, where that's the main conversation. Um, and we're not asking Sean to do lots of different modelings, but just say, what do we think the package might look like um, for the town side? Um, so th that's just my place. So that's where you were going, Lynn, with g getting some of that down. And if we need to go back up to three and a half first, and that was where looking under that line, Sean, how quickly can we come back up? But three and a half million for everything else, having said on JCPC, well, you know these numbers better than I do. Uh, we'll be lucky if we can get the same amount of roads that we've been getting, unless Paul does one of his, I think Paul, you had two years where you said there will be no vehicles. You just had a, we're not gonna do any for a couple of years. And then we had a backlog of vehicles, but you know, so just try, to trying to, to juggle all this, but the, I, I feel like the school is very real and none of us were in control of which project came first. The library's grant came in before everything else, but the one that's coming up that we will have to make a decision on is the school. So I just wanna see some thinking around that um, so that the whole council understands the choices in front of us on, on the mixes. Um, um, thank you. Alicia. Um, thank you, Sean. I just want to support everything that Kathy just said and echo a little bit further that um, I would like to have that conversation around the financing of the school, which I know wasn't specifically included in this model, but I think that because it is the project that we are going to address first, the outcome of that project and specifically of that vote will affect this entire model. Um, and so I think it would be really, really important for us to have that conversation as soon as possible. Yeah, so the, the only thing we're waiting on to, to come back with sort of the impacts of a debt exclusion for the school is, is we're trying to wait for the 
new cost estimate um, to be done because what we don't want to do, we have the old cost estimate, but I worry that we come back and we show the impacts of those and then the new cost estimate comes in and it changes wildly. Um, and so we're not far away from, I mean, we're time is relative, but we're not that far away from um, having the new cost estimate. I hope, I mean, I've, Kathy, unless you've heard otherwise, I think we're supposed yeah. to get the preliminary numbers in December. Um, and then there's a vetting process that goes through, but um, that the numbers will go through. But that was sort of why we have um, haven't shared them earlier is that we know this new cost estimate is coming up. We know that costs are changing very rapidly right now. And so we wanted to wait to have the best uh, before we put a number out there and people say that's how it's going to impact my taxes. We wanted to use the, the last cost estimate of the final cost estimate that we're going to have before that vote happens um, so that there's not a dramatic shift in it. And, and Sean, I wasn't saying go all the way. I was saying we've got enough information right now to know the range of the AMR share right. and to be able to say, is some part of that coming out of reserves rather than all of it debt right. exclusion? That's all I'm raising. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't know for sure what our share is, but we say, suppose it was 5 million less off of debt exclusion. So we just are playing a little bit with flexibility. Um, we've as People know we we have been looking for where there are grants. Um, there is one that's not really a grant, and the town has already signed a memorandum of understanding with Eversource that if we can build an energy efficient building, our net zero and our very tight building, we get some upfront money on construction costs of the building because we're going for geothermal. Um, and they they're giving it to us as a construction, you know, it, it's while the building's being built, but there may be other opportunities and we'll be looking for them, but that's still, we still have to finance the school. So Sean, I was thinking there's something in between a mm -hmm. final number and playing with these numbers that isn't a, the school is an entirely a debt exclusion sure. that we can, we can look at something that says we're splitting it or we're, we're doing some of it's from internal and some of it's debt exclusion. That's all, uh, not getting, I don't think we'll be at the final number till early December in terms of a, a, good, a good cost number, yeah. Bernie? Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, I, uh, I, wanna, I wanna thank you because the model has certainly done what I think is, what I think is important which is begun to really put this on paper where people can see it and force people to start to thinking about what kind of assumptions they wanna make and where they wanna spend, uh, where they wanna put our reserves. So what we're likely to end up with is something that's a hybrid of, of all this, but your, uh, your, your work is, uh, I think has caused a, uh, a particularly good discussion. Uh, I would, be careful about putting numbers out there because people tend to anchor on the, the first number they hear is what they tend to remember. Mm -hmm. So if we get, um, if we have to wait until December to um, uh, get a more firm estimate at the school, I think we need to wait rather than try to push that discussion sooner. We all know we're gonna have to have it. Uh, so uh, again, Thanks for the, thanks for this effort. I think it's been a, a, a great clarification, and well, we're likely to end up with nothing, uh, no model that's on the, of the four that you've created. You've pushed us in the right direction. So thanks. thank you, Lynn. Yeah, I guess the other piece that I I just want to put it out there, okay, and that is that I personally believe that we are at a no other choice on these projects than to build a new build new buildings okay i believe that about the schools i think if that school vote goes down we're going to be sitting here shaking over how much money we're going to have to spend to make the two schools that we we need to tear down habitable we already know that DPW is just falling apart. Its foundation is useless. And our fire station, none of us feel great about asking people to work in these conditions. And so repair is not an option. I just 
cannot be more clear about how we have to make sure that we can keep these buildings going until we replace them, but replacing them is what we have to do. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna jump in because I want to move the, um, start moving us to some conclusion of today's discussion. I do see a hand up, Michelle, and I'm getting to you in a second. Uh, but I did want to just sort of interject that we need to move along with time. One of the things that uh, Lynn mentioned is the condition of the DPW facility. And uh, it is something that we're going to have to consider because we could have huge financial consequences either in short-term Band-Aid repairs for a building that's falling apart anyway, or the need to find a temporary solution if we uh, end up having a crisis at the DPW building before we're able to come up with a solution for the DPW building. So uh, it is something that we do have to bear in mind. Um, I'm going to recognize Michelle, then uh, if there are no further uh, questions or comments from counselors or members of the committee, um, recognize a few minutes for uh, uh, public comment and uh, for uh, getting the fourth quarter year end uh, financial report done. And then I'm going to conclude with some uh, comments about the uh, scheduling for the committee. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, Sean, I was wondering if um, any more consideration um, of the Wildwood site has been given um, in the context of all of this and in the models. Um, I, we, has that been considered at all? What will become of that site or, or the use of that site? And maybe that's not a question you can answer right now, but I just wanted to add that into the mix. I'm sorry, my um my internet is unstable for some reason. So cut out right in the middle. Um, if you could, I heard Wildwood site, and then I cut out. Sure. Yeah, I just was wondering if you had given any consideration to the Wildwood site and the future potential use of that site, um, and whether in any of your modeling that is something that is sort of part of the fold. And I said you may not be able to answer that question right now, right. but I just wanted to add it. To the mix. Yeah, I mean, early on we said that there there are ways where we could use the the sites of uh, vacant sites that could help, you know, could potentially add revenue, you know, increase revenue to the town, um, and that would certainly be something. It's not something factored in right now because we don't know the ultimate fate of those sites and what they'll become. Um, but there are ways to use the, the Wildwood site potentially, or the or the Central Fire Station site potentially. Um, that could increase revenue and make all the models uh, potentially more viable or, or just add more revenue to them. Um, but we, but nothing's built into these yet because we know that that's a, a community discussion and conversation that has to happen. Yeah, that that's great. And that's exactly what I was about to say is just to follow up. I think that might be another discussion that we would want to have as a council um, maybe sooner than later to, to start thinking about that and how it may help to offset some of this burden that we're looking at. So, thanks. So, anything else from the committee of the council and questions or comments about uh, presentation? Um, so quickly, if there's anybody who's uh, an attendee, um, for today's meeting who would like to comment either on the discussion we've been having or on any other financial matter, um, please uh, feel free to raise your hand because we do recognize people for public comment uh, during our meetings. Um, and uh, we wanna try and have public comment limited to three minutes also because we are in the time squeeze, but when I hear from you, Tony is in the room now. And uh, so Tony, unmute yourself, Hi. please. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd also like to support Kathy Shane's comments about um, exploring a model that uses some capital reserves for the school project to reduce the override 
I think we all are aware of the importance of the override passing and that everything else hinges on that passing. So anything we can do to lower that amount and increase the chances of success, I think is a good thing. Um, regarding the assumptions for the cost of the fire station and the DPW, can you provide comparables of the cost of recently built net zero fire stations and public works risk facilities to indicate that these figures are realistic? And then um, the model of three to three and a half million available per year for everything else, uh, that really concerns me. Um, I, I know um, Ms. Grismer mentioned roads and sidewalks and other people talked about other things. I've been following JCPC fairly closely for the last few years. And I see all the things that get postponed because of uh, insufficient funds. And that's with more money than we're proposing here to have available. Uh, most of our town buildings are in need of roof replacements and energy retrofits to get off fossil fuels. Uh, public safety vehicles need to be replaced. Um, sidewalks not only need to be repaired, but new sidewalks need to be constructed. The playing fields at all of the recreational areas are in poor shape. Um, there has been talk in the last year capital plan of the need for a maintenance fund, which I would love to see a part of this year's budget because I think we need a maintenance fund. Um, and then as as was mentioned, Wildwood, if it's not going to, if it's going to be retained for perhaps a multi-use community center, it's going to need repairs and Crocker Farm um, needs repairs. I, I know the windows alone was a half a million dollars on coming up in the next couple of years. So um, thanks for all your work on this, Sean. I would like to see a model that increases the ongoing capital uh, to a more realistic amount so that we don't fall behind on everything else. And then uh, a model that looks at employing five, minimum of five, but preferably 10 million of capital reserves for the school project. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tony. Uh, John, did you have anything you wanted to respond to about uh, comparable buildings or any of the other issues Tony raised? Yeah, so um, if, if you're okay with it, um, so I can, you know, next time we meet, I can share with this committee some of the stuff we've looked at. That being said, I don't, I'm not aware of any comparable net zero fire stations or DPWs, but what we have looked at are um, square foot construction costs of other projects and then escalated them forward using some different assumptions to get us into a ballpark. But at the end of the day, the town is going to have to move forward with what it can afford. Um, and so that's why we're having these conversations with sort of what can we afford now before we develop the design too far. Um, but we have looked at other projects and, and what their construction costs per square foot are um, and, and rolled them forward. But um, adding the, the, the net zero piece is something that we think about, um, but I don't know if there's any good comparables out there currently, but we can, I'll, I'll keep, I'll look more to see if there are. Um, Jeff Lee. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, I just wanted to say I appreciate that Kathy, oh, I'm Jeff Lee from South Amherst, and I appreciate that Kathy and Lynn and Alicia have been willing to consider the capital plan from the point of view of the taxpayers. Um, like the building projects, the challenges facing the building projects, there are serious challenges facing the taxpayers these days with economic conditions. and. Um, so it's it's very concerning to me what I might have to pay in a tax override to support the school project. So I totally support the idea of reducing the tax override as much as you possibly can. Um, and there are also a couple a couple of uncertainties that I think should be modeled. Um, one is what happens if the tax override does not pass the debt exclusion override? Um, will there still be a way that we might able to uh, use the state funding to uh, complete the project. And secondly, uh, what if the library turns out not to be able to go forward because uh, enough funds aren't raised? Um, I think that should be modeled as well. Uh, thanks very much. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I see this, uh, Maria. Kapicki is uh, also raised your hand. Maria, please unmute yourself. And... Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. So I um, uh, also want to support uh, Kathy and Alicia speaking toward decreasing the debt exclusion for the school, uh, for the burden on taxpayers. I am 
concerned about a lot of the assumptions in the models and whether they are realistic, whether a 4% interest rate is realistic, the price tags on the buildings. Um, and in terms of the library, I believe it was uh, Councillor Walker who had requested during those discussions that uh, the model be, uh, that you make some uh, projections of the model if it isn't 15.8. I, I think that sticking with 15.8 and saying that's settled is um, not necessarily realistic itself. Um, and I think that she had asked that there be higher interest rates and higher amounts assumed. Um, and what would that look like? Uh, we can't just, uh, it, assuming 15.8 is, is, does not seem wise to leave it at that. So I'd like you to look more at the assumptions because the model is only as good as what you're putting into it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Maria. So seeing nobody else uh, trying to um, raise something, uh, I would like to propose that we move on to Sonia, <coughs> who's, uh, in the, who's made a, uh, provided us with a very thorough report. And uh, so I think she was prepared to go through this fairly quickly, but wanted to give highlights. So. Uh, Sonia. Hello, everyone. Um, I just want to warn everybody that my internet's been unstable too. Um, I'm here at Town Hall. I don't know why, but I've been fading in and out. So if I do, I apologize. Um, and I want to bring up that our, our free cash has already been certified. We certified at 8.2%. And I'm going to be quick on this report. Um, the report's posted on the accounting website. So if anybody wants to go there and look, it's got quite a bit of detail in there. Um, so I just want to focus on the on the green shaded chart on here. This shows our um, operating surpluses back to 2016. So for fiscal year 22, we ended with a surplus of 4.6 million, and of that, uh, revenue surplus was 3.5. 0.2 million and the expenditure surplus is one almost 1.5 million. And normally in the past, I used to report on the revenues that exceeded 5% of the um, budgeted estimates, but most of them exceeded that because these are um, reduced budgets from, that we're still recovering from COVID. So, and the recovery has been much better than we anticipated. I will point out that um, property tax collections are still strong. And part of this, the surplus here mainly came from economically driven revenues, such as license and permits. They've remained really strong and have contributed to our new growth as well. However, we all know if the economy starts to go down, these will also go down. Um, and just to point out on the chart, you went away from the chart, Sean. You want me to go back to the chart? Yes, just stay on the chart. All right, you tell me when to move. Okay, so just to point out on the chart, we've had really good um, surpluses returned even going through COVID and that's because of reducing the budgets and being really conservative on our revenue budgets as well and the department heads really paying attention to what they're spending on and returning funds there. So, but I also wanna point out that COVID comes from fiscal year 20 through 22, 2019, we had a large revenue surplus there, but I wanted to remind everybody that that is 2 million of that was the health claims trust fund repaying the general fund, 2 million that we borrowed when we were in, um, in deficit in our trust fund back in 2019, uh, 2018. So I just want to remind everybody that's kind of revenue we were just paying back ourselves that we had already collected. Okay, on the expenditure side, we took, uh, we returned one point, almost 1.5 million. And the bulk of that came from functional areas of general government public safety and the schools. General government, we had uh, 
health insurance, premium holiday, which, which helped to return funds there. We also took, we also encumbered $100,000 to cover any FEMA expenses that were not, that will not get reimbursed because we haven't gotten word on that yet. In public safety, there was vacancies in the police department and in Manly Crest because it started later on when we got everybody hired and everybody going. So a lot was returned from there. And the fire department overspent by 59,000, mostly due to the um, first year of their lease for their defibrillators and some retirements there. In the elementary school, the elementary returned 190, about $191,000 from operational savings. And the region returned to 329,000, and that was for the excess in E and D. They are only allowed to keep 5%, I believe, Sean, is that what it is? Yep. Okay. And there was a little savings in our debt. And we can move on to the enterprise funds. There's a chart there for enterprise funds that shows. Our enterprise funds did much better this year than previous years. We have a um, surplus of 426 come, that went back from sewer, water. We still had a small revenue deficit there. There were some expenditure surplus that got returned um, to offset that a little, but we're looking so at our- So if I point something out about water um, real water. quick. Um, so I just, this is a good time. I just wanted to raise a, a, a concern specifically around water. Um, so you'll be seeing water projections soon uh, for setting our rates for the coming year. Uh, one thing that'll be different from last year is that you will see the new uh, Centennial debt projection. So if you recall when you first authorized Centennial or the council first authorized Centennial, it was about 11 million. Um, cost drove that up to a current estimate around 18 million. We do have some grants coming in that will reduce that, and we'll um, we're work, working through the state um, clean uh, the drinking water revolving fund, which will give us a preferential interest rate. Um, so there's there's some benefits there, but overall it's still going to be more that than what we originally anticipated borrowing. Um, so you'll see the impacts of that um, coming up soon. And then the other thing I just wanted to point out about water is. One thing we're monitoring very closely and, and a little concerned about is just water consumption in general. Um, water consumption drives the revenue in the water fund, just you know, as you can imagine. And you would think consuming less water, it, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing um, from a sort of big picture and, and you know the world uh, standpoint, but from a managing an enterprise fund that has a lot of fixed costs and it only brings in money based on how much water it sells. So you, got, you think about this like a water business, um, we're selling less water. And so there was a, there was a trend down before the pandemic um, as there seemed to be a you know, more energy uh, water efficiency measures put in uh, at the university and probably as new developments go in, they're using more efficient fixtures. So there was a little bit of a trend down uh, with the pandemic and students going home, there was a big drop off and then this past year, we were hoping to see it go back up to where it was originally, and it didn't get all the way back to where it was originally, which is why you see this, um, why you see a deficit on the, the revenue side. Um, and so we're, I just, again, I wanted to raise this now because this is probably, will be potentially a theme of when we talk about the budget, um, is where is water consumption going in the future and, and the impact that'll have on rates. So I just, I don't want that to be a big surprise to anybody when we talk about it um, in a couple months. Lynn? And adding to Sean's comments regarding water, because of the new water and sewer regs, you won't see anything this year, but the following year, you may see another additional jump. Right. Go ahead, Sonia, sorry. It's okay. Um, solid waste ended up with a surplus and transportation did as well, even though there was a small revenue deficit. We're looking at we're looking at parking rates now, right, Sean? Yeah, and since I gave 
since I gave gloomy news on the waterfront, I'll give some positive news on the, the trash front. Um, so we do have the solar array that's about to, well, it, it's on and the, and the solar array and the landfill um, is starting to generate um, credits for the town. And it, there's also some rent payments that go along with it. So that's good news for the solid waste, which hasn't had a, you know, a new revenue source in a while. There will be a, a you know, pretty significant new revenue source for solid waste. Um, that will start going in on an annual basis for at least the next 20 years. And for transportation, we will start to see the positive impacts of the, of the uh, permit changes that the council approved um, last year where, you were, where fees are gonna kind of scale up over the next couple of years. Um, so you'll start to see those impacts as well. That's pretty much all I had to say about Sorry. the report, so I'm done. So it has been in the packet. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions, but pause to see if there are any questions at this point. So seeing none at this stage, uh, let me just um, turn a little bit to the question of scheduling for the committee. And by the way, um, I was unable to uh, get through uh, minutes sufficiently to um, do minutes today, but we will do minutes at the next meeting. Also at that meeting, which will be on November 8, uh, we will need to return to a subject that I know some people are unhappy that it's been assigned to the committee, but it is here and that is the road acceptance. and. Uh, there's been some work that's been done on, road, uh, on the issue to um, after our last discussion, so that will get reported to you in due course. Uh, we did agree that we would meet um, on the Tuesdays after council meetings, just as a marker. So that would be November 8, 22, and December 6 for the next three meetings. Um, and. Uh, I see Sean's hands up. Let me just uh, finish what I was going to say and then uh, get back to Sean. Uh, we, um, as a committee, were assigned a number of bylaws that were referred jointly to another committee to work on the bylaw and to the finance committee to look at financial implications. And uh, those were being held for our discussion until there's a framework for um, the programmatic side of the particular bylaws that is being worked through other committees. So that's kind of on hold, but we do have some major things that are coming to us fairly quickly because uh, we will have the uh, financial indicators meeting and uh, once, uh, Judge Sean will remind me of the date because I uh, to make sure that I don't blow it on what, what I say. November uh, 7th. And, uh, you know, after that, uh, we, we start working at that um, meeting on the beginnings uh, and uh, move fairly quickly then after on uh, a proposed uh, set of guidelines for the uh, budget guidelines for the council's consideration. And uh, so we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Um, and uh, we do need to also fit into this uh, further discussion on the capital projects as has started today. So that um, I'm gonna be working with Kathy as vice chair and Sean will try and uh, figure out an appropriate schedule for how to handle this over the next meetings and whether we need to propose an additional meeting. Um, I'm not ready to go there yet. Uh, so Sean, back to you, you had your hand up. Yeah, Please. sorry sorry if you already said this one, but one other agenda item that um, <clears throat> Guilford Maureen has reached out to me to say that they're ready to come back is the, the water regulations that um, Lynn previously mentioned. They presented once to this committee. I think this committee gave them some feedback along with some other committees. And now they have um, what I think is a, a draft that's been further developed that they're hoping to come back to this committee because we never, the finance committee never voted on it or made a recommendation. 
Um, so, they're, so they're ready to come back at some point as well. Or maybe we don't need to, but he asked me about it. So. Yeah, we, we, we can talk about that. I think that the uh, thing about the water regulations is that we had had a pretty good discussion and had uh, um, dealt with financial implications of some of the things we're being talked about, particularly on reassigning responsibility for maintenance of some sections of the system that fall under private property. And that has been taken into consideration by TSO and uh, Town Services and Outreach Committee. So it's, uh, and, and then there was other suggestions that were made on um, other issues that were spotted um, and uh, Bob Hegner had uh, given us a fairly comprehensive memo on, on some of them. And those all have been addressed. So we'll get back to it, but I don't think that it really needs major discussion. And I'm not sure that uh, we're, I'll talk with Lynn later about whether a recommendation for this committee is required. Lynn, you have your hand up. It was for exactly the reason you said. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> yeah, just quickly. Um, yeah, if it's not needed, I'll, I'll let uh, Guilford know. I, I, the one thing that Lynn alluded to earlier is that there are some pretty large financial implications of of both the water regs and potentially the sewer regulations. And so how those get communicated to the council, I think, will be important because it is a there's a large impact financially to the enterprise funds for both of those. You know, I think we will get them back. I'm just not sure that um, um, other than the review, uh, whether to make a recommendation or not as a committee, I would leave to the committee to decide. Uh, so I, but I, but I, we do need to get them back on the agenda, at least to have people have an opportunity to look at what is now there and see if there are any additional comments to be offered. Michelle? I just wanted to check in with Paul about that because I know the uh, water bylaw came to GOL last week and then there was some follow-up and I, and I think Anna has now left the meeting, but um, and there were fee structure questions and enforcement uh, questions and th there may be financial implications there. Um, we had to sort of send it back. We weren't able to finish the review because those items hadn't been fully fleshed out yet. So I just wanted to add that in. And just if I can jump in. On it. So the town attorney is reviewing that as we speak. So um, anything else that uh, people, anybody from the committee wishes to raise or the council wishes to suggest uh, needs to be considered by this committee? Because it's after five o'clock, and uh, if there's uh, no objection, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Seeing no objection, I am adjourning the meeting. So thank you very much. Have a productive afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>